What's up, my people? Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church's Sermon Spotlight, where we're coming at you each and every week with a fresh weekend to debrief in an effort to send biblical truth. What better way to do that than by the power of conversation? I'm one of your hosts, Caleb Pearson, joining me again in the host spotlight. I love it when she's here, Miss Rose Locke. Rose, how are you? I'm doing great, Caleb. Good, Thanks. good. Thank you for being here uh, today. Uh, he's back with us. Uh, you know him, Mark Carey. Mark, how you doing, my friend? Doing well. Good. Uh, Sunday was an eventful oh, one. Oh, it was eventful. Uh, very much so during and the first service. I'll have to say that fire alarm has to be one of the loudest sounds there is. Mm. I've but always it, thought that. It didn't blare for very long, did it? It was just the lights, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, we I was delayed. I was delayed a little bit leaving. You probably got out of the building faster than I did. The we youth were... kids, boom, <laughs> we were out. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we had children's to... ministry was on it. They came right through, and we went out. Yeah. We 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 were streaming. We needed to stop the stream. We wanted to replace the pre roll so people weren't looking at an empty stage. Because if we did, like we had some back end work we did, so we didn't get out of the building probably as fast as you did. Tech so it was team. very loud. Tech team, they always go down with the ship. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's good. The captain says, uh, tech team, you stay finished up. Uh, you go down with the ship. I'm getting out of here. As of 1 p.m. today, the video of that was still on YouTube. We had one 18-minute clip before oh, really? JVD went up. It had five times. Is that how long had, the stream went? Before we, before yeah, we started the pre-roll minutes, again. 18 okay, minutes, there you yeah. go. It had, it had five times as many views as the actual sermon because oh, I think really? people went back to watch, <laughs> to watch JVD. So they, they said they were going to take it down. But anyway, if you found that Easter egg, it was fun to I watch that. JVD walk on up there and stop worship. But it was awesome, though. Safety team did a great job. It was cool to be a part of it. The kids loved it. People got to talk outside. It's cool. We are the church nonetheless. Uh, Rose, I'm going to come your way okay, first. great. Off air, uh, Rose always gets to this <laughs> podcast. I have nothing to control. Tribute. I don't like it when Caleb comes to me first, and then, as we all know, she does wonderfully. So, oh, well, what were your thoughts on this weekend? Oh well, first of all, it's such a huge chunk of scripture, and mm. I um, really appreciate you, Mark, tackling it actually as one thing because it is one thing, and it kind of helps us see it as one thing. This whole mm-hmm. big sermon he preaches, but I have to tell you what what struck me and what I have highlighted. You can see it. if you're on video, you can see it in pink. What I highlighted in pink was. Um, Mark, you pointed out, just as kind of an aside, on Saturday night, now Mm. did it make it to the other? Each sermon was very different this weekend, by the way. (laughs) Um, But on Saturday night, you pointed out these words, bewildered, amazed in astonishment, amazed in great perplexity, and just this idea of how like what an incredible event this was. And you talked about 120 people talking in different languages all at the same time. And so the excitement and the energy um, of this great gathering where the sermon takes place, I think just really struck me. And my in my walk, when I see God working, and when I'm aware of the Holy Spirit, I hope that I can have that same kind of amazement and awe that they developed Hmm. at that moment. So did you cram in 20 20 minutes during the first hour of your sermon after the fire alarm, like 9 a.m.? Well, I think you did all 40 minutes, correct? Right. Yeah, yeah. all 40. I think I started at at 20 till, we we, we got back in in a half hour. Okay. It was about a half hour delay. We got in, boom. Okay. Rose hit the bumper video. <laughs> I did. I just I texted. Yeah. I'm like, I'm playing the bumper as soon as Mark's ready. Yeah. I, yeah. And I even okay, good. If you were here, you got to hear my voice. If you hear my voice on Sunday mornings, you know it's crazy morning. <laughs> so I actually announced as people were coming back in the building twice. Yeah. I made two announcements, explaining to them what they were about to experience because I'm sure they were all probably a little oh, yeah. disoriented. disoriented yeah. And I thought it was helpful for them to oh, kind yeah. of regather, oh, that's knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. But yeah, so I did have to cut some things okay. uh, to. Yeah. Get, get get us done, but um, yeah. yeah. So the F one crowd didn't get the the whole thing, but uh, <laughs> you you can go online and get the whole thing. Yeah. Um, the but, one that's online is F two. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. The F two service. Mm-hmm. No, it's a it's a um, it's Peter's first sermon, uh, and it's his first sermon after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So it's like. Um, um, I think it was uh, Dwight Al Moody was asked one time, "Why why do people come and listen to you?" And he basically said, "Because I'm on fire for Jesus, and people love to come and watch someone burn." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what was happening with Peter. Um, hmm. The Spirit of God falls. It's the day of Pentecost. Uh, the um, a, a, a required feast that people would come up to Jerusalem for. This mm-hmm. is all planned in the heart of God. 
and uh, I don't I, I don't know if I I don't think I explained it certainly in the first service I might have in the second I did Saturday night but the feast of Pentecost was and that's the Greek term pent from the word fifty it's really the feast of harvest or mm-hmm. some the Jewish feast of weeks it mm-hmm. was fifty days after the Passover and it was the planned feast set up by God. Uh, and they would take two loaves that were leavened, and leaven refers to sin, you know, in the old in the Old Testament. In the Passover, you take unleavened bread, but this is leavened bread. It's a, and it's a celebration of the wheat harvest. But you take these two loaves and uh, offered before the Lord. It's part of the the ritual of the feast, and so you kind of wonder, well, what? Why did God choose this feast hmm. to begin? This new work of the Holy Spirit, the age of grace, the age of the church, the age of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and I, I most commentators would say that the sim, the symbolism of those two loaves is the coming together of Jews and Gentiles into one entity, sinful people, hmm. the leavened bread of the two loaves coming together in one body. For the purpose of, as Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Mm-hmm. Uh, go in your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world and reap a harvest. So it's the feast of, feast of Pentecost, the feast of harvest, the loaves coming together, the, the um, um, harvest of, of souls. Now, in the first chapters here of Acts, and certainly on that day of Pentecost, the people there had no idea that there was another loaf. Uh, the Gentiles. Not yet. Not it's yet. It's coming very soon, though. It's coming yes. soon, but at that time, it I mean, it, it wasn't clicking. They didn't put that together. And one reason why is in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus, after he was uh, resurrected and before he ascended, that 40 days, he's not teaching them about the church. He's not teaching them about this Gentiles coming in and all this stuff. And you would think, I mean, if, if it was me... I would have outlined that thing because, I mean, it was 10 days later. It's happening. And one of the biggest problems in the early church was this recognition of Gentiles and Jews and all coming to No way. I mean, that just doesn't happen. So why didn't Jesus teach on that for 40 days? Get, get, them, get them off to a running start. But he doesn't. He's teaching them about the kingdom. And when we talk about the kingdom... Well, what are we talking about? And um, we uh, we set that stage in some previous sermons, but clearly the kingdom. As you go into the prophets and what Jesus would have taught on from the from the prophets from the Old Testament was this time of uh, the age of the Messiah, the coming of the the servant, who uh, the the servant king, Isaiah fifty three, Isaiah forty two, all the the servant songs, and the the setting up of his kingdom in Jerusalem, where all the nations will come and and worship and and the perfect righteousness and the perfect justice will be set up on this earth in this uh, this reign of the servant king. Um, that's what Jesus was talking about. So that's what Peter, when when the Holy Spirit came, it fit perfectly with the Old Testament. Because that was prophesied, the outpouring of the Spirit, in the coming of the kingdom. Right. And I, you know, I found it really helpful. Um, and again, I, most of my notes are from Saturday evening because I was distracted. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I know, Mark, you just did a great job recovering from that and not being, it didn't appear to us you were overly distracted by it. I was pretty distracted. <laughs> and so most of my notes are from Saturday night. But on Saturday night, particularly, I really appreciated your um, talking about verse 34. Um, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And I, I've always found that psalm confusing, and I, and I to- completely didn't understand it. And even in this context, it was very challenging for me to understand. But the way you talked about it and connected it with Matthew twenty two forty one, I just thought was really helpful to me um, to understand Peter's train of thought. I felt kind of like... Um, uh, Listening to you talk through this passage, Mark, I felt a little bit like I was listening to a, a speech teacher, like um, analyze someone a speech that had just been presented mm-hmm. to me. And you know, here's his introduction, and here's his—you uh, called it his 
uh, correction. Here's his first correction and his second correction. Here's his proof. Here's what he meant when he laid out his proof. And then here are his conclusions. And I just found it really helpful to approach it like from that kind of um, assessment perspective, yeah. assessing how he was thinking and what his logical thought process was. And at least I, Saturday night, man, maybe the, the F3, I, I started with the conclusion. I said, this is where Peter's going. Mm-hmm. So the, but verse 36, you know, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. So that's where he was going. Then to back up and see, it's a nicely packaged sermon. I mean, it's it's it the way the way it unfolded and what Luke, and I'm sure Peter said more than what's recorded here by Luke, mm-hmm. but what Luke included uh, under divine inspiration uh, said it all. Uh, and and he used going back to your point, Rose. Peter wove in some really powerful passages, of, like mm-hmm. Psalm 16 and, and Psalm 132, and of course that last one, Psalm 110, the most um, the most uh, referred to Psalm in the um, in the New Testament. So the focal point, though, we can't. I wanted to emphasize the focal point of his message was the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he has to begin with addressing what is this, they ask in verse 12. What is this that has just happened? The wind, the fire, the speaking in tongues. And in verse 16, he says, well, this, what is this? This, all this, well, this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he, he brings that in with Joel and saying, this is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And that's, that is, uh, I mean, that, that's huge for the people listening that here is an Old Testament prophet. They had longed, when, when, you know, when are these days coming? When is this happening? When's, and all of a sudden, Peter said, today, <laughs> this is the fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Um, now, not everything was fulfilled, because that's what prophecy is. But mm-hmm. the last days had begun. And it began with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's going to end with judgment. Uh, and that was a point I didn't bring out. Uh, I, I I'm going to in a couple weeks, but um, we can't lose sight of the fact that when the Jews are pierced in the heart in verse 37, and they're asking the Lord, or asking Peter, what should we do? Uh, it's kind of in the context of understanding that in in Joel, and I think again, um, what was probably well known, Joel's sermon ends, or Peter's quote of Joel to ends in verse 20, where the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord uh, shall come. And you go back to Joel, you don't want to be mm-hmm. in the day of the Lord. You don't want to be there. And uh, it's not going to be a, a, a good time. He does give the promise in verse 21, um, and um, it shall be that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be rescued. But the very fact that he uses that word saved or rescued means there's some doom. There's something mm-hmm. bad that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And Peter put the pieces together in the sermon and basically said, and, and, and that was emphasized. I didn't bring that out strongly in the sermon like I should have. But over and over again, he would said, you crucified this. <laughs> you know, it was God's predetermined plan, verse 23. By the foreknowledge of God, the predetermined plan, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men. You did this. And at the conclusion, he said the same thing. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. Well, what pierced them to the heart was the fact, we did this. We did it just, you know, 40 days ago or, uh, you know, yeah, a little over 40 days ago. Mm-hmm. And we put to death the promised one. Well, look, God that didn't make God happy. And Joel too is talking about mm-hmm. the judgment is coming and this day of the Lord is gonna fall upon you. You the ones who crucified the one. And uh, again, the, the Peter's focus on Christ, 
those first v- verses on, on his death, verses um, uh, 22 and 23, and then he switched in 24 through 32 about his resurrection. So he emphasizes this Jesus, God raised from the dead. He has been raised, he's resurrected, and he goes to Psalm 16 for that proof that it was not David. David's still tomb, entombed. And then he closes with the ascension, with his glorification. He's been exalted to the right hand. Hmm. The death, the resurrection, the exaltation of Christ. And by the way, that is something else that could a whole sermon could be put on or a whole podcast, but we we do not I don't think we focus enough on the ascension and the impact of of the exaltation of Christ. Mm-hmm. In the liturgical church calendar, there's Ascension Sunday. Yes. And and probably a lot of mainline liturgical churches don't have a heart, don't understand it or don't emphasize it, but it's a ritual at least. But we in the non-liturgical confessional church, reformational church, uh, I mean, the ascension was crucial. And mm-hmm. Paul, uh, Peter brings that out in a sermon, that the reason the Holy Spirit was poured out because, is because there was an Where ascension. Jesus is. Yeah. So he, yeah. he packages all this together in this incredible uh, sermon. And it, it, it's in a way that's biblically familiar in that he does weave Old Testament scripture. I mean, that's something that continues throughout the, the New Testament. Paul embodies a lot of that as well. You, you get to use some of these older passages and, and shed light on them, and we are still doing that today. Like, there's still these opportunities to hear the teaching and the speaking, and and you want to weave in scripture yeah. so that it, it points to that grand narrative. So many of our ministries are wanting to remind people their identity, who they are in Christ, the grand narrative of the Bible, and biblical dependency. And we, we can do that by realizing the stories here. Right. Like all this happened. Now, it is interesting, once you get past chapter 8 of Acts, Old Testament quotations are pretty diminished. Hmm. So... Well, isn't that a ge- geography, right? In a sense, that's, and also going to the to the Gentiles right. who don't have that. So, um, it, it right, Paul be needed says, for right. support. Right, it wouldn't yeah. be needed for support. But not only that, but like if you start if you start telling some people over there in Greece about what the Jews believe, they're not going to listen to you <laughs> yeah. anymore, yeah. right? So it, yeah. there is that idea. Um, of Paul, you know, I became like the f- few, I became like the few so I could win the many. Is that the yeah. right quote? So there's this idea that you, the audience you that you're adapt. speaking to, like speak, speakers know that well, it's right? You have a, to relate and connect to your audience. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt no, you. It's, it's such a practical thing. We think it's all so spiritual <laughs> and, and enigmatic and mysterious, the way all this, you know, flew together in the Bible. This was practical stuff. It came down to faith and trust and, and the Spirit working through these guys. And man, yeah, to learn the historical information about the church and then understanding the implications now is is truly Right. And incredible. I think, it, like, to me, I, I want to connect it a little bit back to um, when Tim Sanford has been speaking in this series. Tim, um, is bringing often it back to the every man, like the common mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like talking about Matthias, right, last week. Um, and I think there is something here. I, like I also made notes about like Jesus the Nazarene. Mark, you care, you pointed that out on Saturday as well. Like when he said Jesus the Nazarene, he's, he's saying the hillbillies up in Nazareth, mm-hmm. you know. And so this idea that God uses the weakest and the common to mm-hmm. fulfill his plan. I think and, we even see that Luke here. And Luke loved that. Yeah. In his gospel <laughs> and, and yeah. in this book of Acts. One, uh, another clarification, um, and, and it's, a, it's just an observation, but uh, as, as Peter um, focuses on the resurrection of Christ, and he quotes that Psalm 16, and he comes in verse 30, and he says, so because David was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath that he would seat uh, one of his descendants on his throne. And that's the, the quote probably from Psalm 132. So he quotes that. D- David looked ahead and saw, uh, and under divine inspiration as he was writing that psalm, um, he, lo- he understood um, that the promise of God from um, Samuel, the, the Davidic covenant that someone from his lineage would would be a perpetual uh, would s- sit on that throne of David perpetually. Now, here's the thing to, to emphasize or to, to just guard. I think guard against um, when you go then and jump down to verse 34. 
It was not David who ascended into heaven, but himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make the enemies a footstool for your feet. Is, did Jesus ascend to the throne? Did he ascend to the throne that David uh, um, thought he would, the Davidic throne? Uh, so some people, I think, make the wrong connection between verse 30, uh, the quote of Psalm 132, God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And then a few verses later, we're talking about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. So, huh. and, and, and for what it's worth, I'm not going to argue this, you know, but there's many people, good, good scholars who would say that Jesus is right now that the kingdom has started in the sense of the Davidic kingdom, that Jesus is reigning on the Davidic throne because of that quote mm -hmm. f from Psalm 132 in proximity to the th verse 34. And, and I think that's, a, I think that's it, it, it's what's called um, progressive dispensationalism. Uh, you know, good, again, good scholars hold, will hold to that. I don't think that's what mm -hmm. Peter was referring to. Jesus is not sitting, to my understanding of on the Davidic throne. On the Davidic throne, right. he's sitting on God's throne. I mean, on the on the mm -hmm. throne in heaven, exalted. But that's not David's throne. Mm -hmm. And I think to equate that, almost both thrones are wonderful, but David's the throne... throne's got nothing on God's. <laughs> that's yeah. right. I mean, it's almost minimizing yeah. what Jesus is doing now, uh -huh. which was uh -huh. one of the things things I wanted to bring out in the conclusion of the sermon was this. This high exalted, what Jesus is doing now on that throne, is a whole different bunch of things than what he will one day do on the Davidic throne. Mm -hmm. But he's not sitting on David's throne right now because that's in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and that's on earth. So I think many people make that mistake, but it wasn't worth bringing that out in a sermon because right. a lot of people but don't that, care. But that's helpful to me because, <laughs> you know. because one, of the, one of the questions, Mark, to be honest with you, that ran through my mind, I, I mean, of course, these last nine, we were just counting, making sure we all had the right number, these last nine mm -hmm. things you put so nicely in the notes. Um, I wondered why you felt so strongly about including those specifically in the sermon. And right now you are explaining that to us. Yeah. Like that's the reason. Because, I, I mean, I made the connection, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of material you were trying to get through. And so that is a, an extended application. And I wondered why that yeah. important extended application. And, and, and partly because when you teach the scriptures, and this is, again, it's it's... Uh, historical literature, um, this sermon doesn't apply to us. It was given to that first century group of Jews, I mean, in the sense that it, that was the audience. So, but I'm preaching to a 21st century audience that are non-Jews. But mm -hmm. so, so what can you, and you're dealing with this as oh, you yeah. continue to yeah. grow in your preaching skills. Uh, so, so where is the valid applications because you just don't want to pull things out of it, the air because that's that's not right either yeah. so to focus on that last idea that the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand until i make the enemies a footstool for your feet the question was so what is jesus doing at that right hand mm -hmm. and now i can make applications to mm -hmm. us today mm -hmm. and those nine that i listed were just just a few and and every one of those could be a sermon of oh yeah, yeah of exactly amazing which is, thing which is one of the reasons i was asking like because you could have just said you could have just your first one he's building the church right mm -hmm. so you could have just said so what's the application today well he's building the church so the church has value right but instead you chose to list to give us this list and um there's probably more is that would that be you know mm -hmm. if we really oh, search yeah. scriptures we could find more things yeah. that scriptures tells yeah. christ is doing so that was one of my questions is why yeah why just in and date us with this list. Well, and I appreciated you know? how fast it was and how there was an overwhelming sense that he's doing this, he's doing this, because there was a little bit of like, I don't know if I'm going to grasp all that. <laughs> yeah, you might not. You and know? that's why I put yeah. the verses in there too. Yes, yeah. right. But here's a reference, here's what he's doing, yeah. and it, it just speaks to, oh my goodness, there's so much here that does create an awareness. And, and that's, we think about our own difficulty, our own struggle, 
to think about where Jesus is and what he's doing is is everything. Yeah. Right? We right. don't want to just know that he died on the cross for our sins. Right. Yes, that's incredible. But where he is at now right. implicates us. And right. to make that then that distinction between that uh-huh. and the Davidic throne, which is another whole set of things he's going to do one day. Yes. Right. That's good. It's yeah. it's yeah. and I, I yeah. And I yeah. think I think Mark, at least for me, when you when you inundate us with a list like that and you provide us with the scripture reference, that's a call to me. And I've said that here before. That's my call now. Wow, that was a lot. Wow, I don't, like Caleb, I don't know how I'm gonna digest all that. Wait, what, this is the end of the sermon, how am I supposed to process this? Well, the answer to me is, I'm gonna sit down with the references. He cited his sources, I'm gonna sit down with his references, I'm gonna read through those references. Um, uh, Probably not all nine this week, but, one of them that catches my eye or one of them yeah. that I'm curious about. And and there's a subtle thing I appreciate, and this is not just a true of Mark, but a lot of the, the teachers and speakers and elders and pastors here, the, the references are there for the applications as well. And so you're not just taking his word for it. You're not, I tell my youth kids, especially my small group, I've had them since seventh grade, don't trust me alone just because I've happened to be your teacher for five years. Measure what mm-hmm. I'm saying against the Word of God. Mm-hmm. If a human's Absolutely. mouth is open, it doesn't matter if you're like, I'll, whatever they say, sign me up. No, be careful. Yeah. Measure it against Scripture. Understand, okay, that's a biblical that's a biblical right. thing that was just right. said. And it's and becoming, you know, Caleb, you I, think, yeah. I, think that, I think that what you're telling the kids there is becoming just more and more and more practical because I find myself... Seriously, if I need a piece of information or I have a question, mm. I find there are so many sources and there are so many opportunities to find answers mm. that I find myself stopping early. Yeah, I find sure. myself asking the first one and taking that one as truth. Mm. And so I think this I think leaving us with a call to go look for ourselves is yeah. really yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. Peter modeled it, mm-hmm. what you just said, the use of scripture. And um, the thought was, where did he come up with those? <laughs> because it's like he pulled them. Ac- now, we understand right. divine inspiration, all that stuff. And then we realize we got it from those 40 days of Jesus' teaching. And if, we're, mm. if we were curious uh, back in chapter uh, 1, when it says that um, um, in verse 3, that Jesus for over a period of 40 days was speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God, if we were curious and said, man, I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. What I wonder what Jesus taught on for 40 days concerning the kingdom. Well, we got a glimpse yeah. of it here. Peter, you know, it was just 10 days later, he's and he's drenched with mm-hmm. the scriptures and the teaching that Jesus had offered him. And so Jesus, I think, used Joel 2. Jesus used Psalm 16 and 132 and 110. Mm-hmm. And so Peter was regurgitating out of the abundance which is of the, truth that Jesus Which used. is the strength of doing the whole sermon on one weekend, even though it's 40 verses. There was probably an element of, this is how I heard it, and here's what it is. Yeah. It's a lot. Things are different. I We learned a lot. There's no, <laughs> We just learned a lot the last 40 days. If you want to bear with me, <laughs> the fire hydrant's going, you yes. know, and, and it bleeds into the excitement of that time. The nice thing is that the Peter's audience... A Jewish audience had a context. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't, and so that was the only hesitation. There was, you know, you, you could go back. It doesn't it kind of make you want to go back and read Joel. What, oh, yeah. what, what was time. that context? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and and then all of why is Psalm 110 quoted mm-hmm. most often? And then why why what what is it about that Psalm? So Peter just pulled one little verse out of it, and mm-hmm. but when yeah. he when he said Psalm 110 or when he quoted that, everybody knew. They had that whole context. Uh, we yeah. don't, but right. um, and I mean, e- even go back to to chapter. Uh, is, I mean, chapter two, I think, verse fifteen. You know, where uh, is it one? Uh, one fifteen, where Peter, after there's there, you know, Jesus has ascended and they're together, and there's 120 people mm-hmm. there, and Peter is the one who stands up and says, "Okay, we." So you have to give Peter some credit too, mm-hmm. because he's their spokesman. You know I mean, he's mm-hmm. not afraid to say what he's been taught, yeah. and he's not afraid to encourage the others to get involved and to say what he's been yeah. taught. So I, I like Peter. And 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 um, <laughs> Tim would uh, Sanford would love to do a, I'm sure a a, a um, biographical study on or a sermon on Peter, because here maybe for the first time. 
Peter gets up and he opens his mouth and his foot wasn't in it. <laughs> yeah. You know, isn't yeah. it because of the yeah. power of the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. And uh, right. and don't you think the people there saw that in Peter? Oh, yeah. Now? They mm-hmm. saw now, like they. I don't think you could have helped but miss the change. Right. Mm-hmm. You yeah. Mean? And good. and they knew they knew that before the crucifixion he was afraid. They had to have known that. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And now he's standing in the midst of them with no fear, yeah. proclaiming Saying, Here Christ. And, said. and we'll yeah. see that in the next couple of weeks mm-hmm. as well, the, the boldness uh, because yeah. of the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Whew, that's good. Rose, thank you for being here. Yeah, You're I, awesome. I really enjoy being here, good, actually. Good. It's very that's fun for me. Mark, thank you, my friend. Mm-hmm. Much appreciated. As a reminder to our viewers and listeners, you can find us on your favorite podcast platforms all over the place. Just type in Sermon Spotlight. We pop right up. The fact of the matter, everybody, is that sermons are not meant to take an hour, but rather transform a lifetime. Until next week, much love, God bless.